about the heart, the Hebrew word is lep, and the Greek or New Testament equivalent is nous, from where we get the word um, psychosis and psychology. It's to do with our thinking and our minds. And within that, I was thinking about the ways in which our minds disrupt, um, the ways in which our minds can disrupt our lives, the ways in which our minds can um, talk us out of doing some of the things that we need to do. Um, even before, whenever we have uh, a test, an exam, even before we have um, an interview or we are about to go for something that's really important to us, all of the old fears begin to resurface. Things that we have done a thousand times um, and in private, as soon as we become in come in public, the skill that we had in private disappears because of fear, because sometimes we're not in control of our minds. Um, sometimes as we are going forward for the things that are, that are important to us, the things that are necessary for us to achieve our fulfillment in life, those old voices come reoccurring. And so part of growing in our spirituality is loving God ourselves and our neighbors with our minds. And part of loving ourselves with our minds has to do with paying attention to what matters. Paying attention to what matters. And so for our reflection this morning, I'd like to read again um, a passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's in chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 8. It says, finally beloved. And I think we could just stop there. Finally beloved. That's who you are. Whatever is true. Whatever is honorable. Whatever is just and promotes justice. Whatever is pure. Whatever is pleasing. Whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Let's train our minds. Train our minds just to really focus on, number one, on our identity in God as God's beloved. Whatever you're going to be going, doing this week, whatever tests, examination, meetings, appointments, scheduling you have to manage this week. Above all, remember that you are God's beloved. Amen. And then I want you to think about what is true. Think about what is honorable. Think about what is just. Think about what is pure. Think about what is pleasing. Think about what is commendable. Think about what is excellent in you and in others. Think about what is worthy of praise. Orientate your mind around the best in yourself and the best in others. Think on these things. Keep your mind stable. Allow your mind to become the steering wheel of your life. That as you focus and as you direct your thoughts, you begin to move in the direction of those dominant thoughts about justice, about truth, about honor, about purity, about play, pleasing and pleasure. And I'm glad he put that in there. Sometimes we negate pleasure. But a sign of your spiritual and emotional health is the ability to experience pleasure. What is commendable? What is excellent? What's worthy of praise? Let's just think. Let's just think. Let's just think. We're going to pray. Um, first, I'm going to pray for us here. And then we're going to open up for any prayer requests. Loving God, we thank you so much for the facility of the brain. For the mind, for memory. We thank you, Lord, for the regulation of our neurological processes. And we thank you that you are a heart fixer, in the words of the old saints, and a mind regulator. We have been traumatized. We have been 
uh, in some instances victimized. We've gone through a whole lot. We've experienced grief. We've experienced loss. We've experienced in our life disappointment. We've had pain. Some of us have had multiple betrayals by loved ones. And it is easy. It's almost a default setting to orientate our lives around the things we are afraid of and avoiding the things that hurt us. However, Lord, we ask that you would heal us of our brokenness and our woundedness. Heal us in those places where we have been hurt and where we are currently hurting. Deliver us from an identity based in victimhood. Help us to see ourselves above and first of all as the beloved of God. God's unique masterpiece. The person that you fawn over. We thank you so much for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We ask that you would control our lives. We bring every thought into submission to Christ. We bring every thought into submission to the ways of Christ. We come against fear and against doubt. And we come against those things not just with words, but we come against those things with attitudes. Instead of fear, we have a positive approach. We trust that we will be the best and we will experience the best outcomes and we are prepared for when things go wrong as they inevitably will do. We recognize that we have the ability to maximize the lessons from failure and come back stronger. And so Lord, we thank you for the peace that comes and passes all understanding. Guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Uh, would you just rest your head, uh, yes. hand on your head? Hallelujah. Guard our minds. Rest your head, hand on your heart. Protect and guard our hearts. Help us, Lord, to live courageously. Help us to live beyond fear. So, yes, fear is there, but we move beyond fear. And we lean into trusting in you. We lean into yes. depending on you. In Jesus' name. Just before we launch forward into our worship further, are there any prayer requests that folks have today? Can we just continue to pray for the time? Yes, yes. Yes, pray for Marley. We pray for everyone that's undertaking exams. Um, I know you're on the home stretch, particularly those in years uh, 11, 12, and 13, and of course those in the you really, thank God they're finished. <laughs> but we're thanking God. Lord, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. The name that is a strong tower that we can run into and find safety. We pray, Lord, for your continued healing power in the life of Tabitha. Yeah. Touch her mind, her heart, her soul. Ancient wounds, wounds that have been inflicted. We pray that you would help her to experience current, today, healing that will reach backward and do the things that need to be done to produce health. Touch her, Lord, and bless her. And we pray that as she walks through this healing process, she will recognize that she's not alone. We pray, God, for Marley. We thank you that he is recovering and um, that he is finding his strength. We pray that you continue to bless him and increase him. Pray for those who are going through examinations, whether they be um, GCSEs, whether they be A-levels, whether they be... Um, some final, whether in whatever year of a advanced learning postgraduate study, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would allow people to be the best that they can be. Pray that the discipline of study and, and also the hopefulness where we have not studied as much as we should, we pray God that you bring things together in a way that will allow each and every person to have the very, very best result possible. Help each of us to live within the law of the farm, that there is seed time and there is harvest. And Lord, at those things which we have sown in tears, help us to reap in joy. And we thank you, and we will give you the glory, and we will bless your name forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's worship together. Let's stand and give God praise.
Sunday. So good to see everyone. So good to connect. 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 <laughs> it's wonderful. That's what we're talking about today. We're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about a subject that we don't often like to talk about, and that is the word loneliness. Loneliness. Oh, I want to talk to you today about the myths. I want to talk to you today about the challenges. And I want to talk to you about the blessings, even while you're coping with loneliness. Ooh. And this was laid on my heart, and I want to share it with you today. I talked about connection, the opposite of connection. This is the definition. Here it comes. This is a simple version. In terms of loneliness, it's basically about being alone but linked with the feeling of sadness and isolation. That's all it is, in the simple terminology. And we often, everybody loves, God wants us to connect. God loves when you connect. I love seeing you all. You know, I love just like that kind of, oh, how are you, how are you doing, what's going on? We all love that, don't we? But there is a difference between you wanted to separate yourself for a while. Did you know what? I've had enough of uh, the man indoors. Not that I have enough of him, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I've had enough of the kids. Let me just go away on a nice little spree on my own. There's a difference between you taking time out and being alone. That's not the same thing as loneliness. Okay? I just want to make sure there's a difference there. Yeah? So, what does the shadow? I'll just give you a, a simple before I go into scripture and the myths and all of that. I just want to just remind you about a st study that say the number one reason why people go to therapists is because of loneliness. Apparently, that's apparently so. And it doesn't matter what age you are young, old, middle aged, rich, poor. I think the study showed in 2022 from the ages of 16 to 24 is the widest age of people that are feeling lonely. Mm -hmm. And this is post-COVID. So it is a stigma. It is something that people do not like to talk about. But we're going to talk about it today. And the stigma with loneliness exists with all of us, whether we be in the church or out of the church. Saying the words, I am lonely. Like you're admitting defeat. Yeah. Like, I'm meant to be a Christian man. We don't have to be lonely. I'll never be lonely again. Never again. Jesus blood is running through my bed. Come on, that's what we're singing it. No more trouble, no more pain. No more. We sing that. Because the idea is we should never be lonely. But I want you to know it's a human condition. And I want to deal with this today. And I want to deal with the myths. Let's get rid of the myths. Let's get, so get rid of the myths. The myths are about people that, that their, their truths told to you in your mind. Talk about mind, body, and soul in the worship. Things that are caught up in your mind that you start believing that is true about loneliness. The first myth you cannot be lonely because you have loads of friends. Incorrect. You can still be lonely and have lots of friends. You might be in a room of many, many people. People cheering your name. Rory, Rory. Don't matter. I could still be lonely. Many people have many followers on Insta or wherever, on Facebook. But they profess, they confess, I'm still lonely. So that myth must be destroyed. You can still be lonely if you have friends. The second myth. relationships and intimacy and that will stop me from being lonely. Incorrect. It does not stop you. The physical act of intimacy with somebody else is not enough. You can still be lonely. They will wipe their mouth, whoever they are, and they will ask you, what's your surname? Because I can't even remember your first name. It's not about that. And someone said, yeah, more about, I just need somebody. Somebody is better than nobody. I get that a 
lot than the work that I do. Somebody's better than nobody. I don't want to be a single parent. But it is better to be alone, and I say this often, it is better to be alone than to be a single parent and you're in an abusive relationship. It is better. But boy, what about, what, about, what about the ones that I'm committed to? I'm committed in my relationship. Surely you're not lonely when you're in a committed, loving relationship with no abuse. Yeah, you can still be lonely. No one is excluded from this. And I, I found it interesting when I, uh, I, I wanted to just share with you one quote. I don't often share a, a quote from an actor, but this actor ended his life. Amazing actor. And his name was Rob, uh, Robin Williams. And he said this quote, I used to think that the worst thing in life was to end up alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to end up with people who make you feel alone. And I think that's true. I think that's so true. And I just had to share that with you. The third thing is, well, I am lonely because I blame myself. I'm just not good enough. Oh, not necessarily. You can be lonely at any age, as I said before. And the final myth I want to share is, which is the one that I want to hold into to get into the text, and that is Christians can never be lonely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're on our Christian journey. We've got Jesus. We've got Jesus. And that's enough. But actually, you can be a devout person of faith. You can be a person that's zealous for God. You can be a person that wants to do the best for God. You can, you can have the heart of God. And God loves you. And yet, you can still be lonely. And we know that from David. When David said, I'm lonely. We heard the scripture that talks about, why did I cast down on my soul? Put your hope in God. David was distraught. But it's not David we're talking about today. I want to talk to you about a man called Elijah. Elijah was a man of God. And what's amazing about Elijah, before I read that text, is that he was in a celebratory moment. He was in a moment of greatness because he had just won a battle saying against, against the mini-gods. And he had won this battle to show that God was God. He should have been on cloud nine. He should have been just celebrating. And you know what? You know there's times in our own lives where we are celebrating stuff. But we're lonely. Let me give you an example. My kids, oh my gosh, have all got into the university they want and they've all gone off. It's wonderful it's a celebration. But then you look in your house and you think, oh, I'm lonely. There's no one around. <laughs> It's celebratory, but it's actually loneliness mix as well. You might be going or off to university and you're in a new college and it's great. This is wonderful. Free at last. Free at last. <laughs> and you get there and you think, oh, I'm lonely. So the mixture of celebration versus loneliness happens often in our lives. And we have to try and juggle that. I remember when a few years ago, I was getting ordained, but at the same time, I was, there was some stuff going on that I couldn't really celebrate properly. Stuff with my family, stuff that was heartache, pain, um, bereavement. I'm thinking, Lord Jesus, celebrating something, but get lonely because you can't really express it. In the text that I'm going to read, Elijah had that same situation. And he, had just finished winning the battle, so he should have been on cloud nine. But something happened to cause him to go into loneliness. So here we have the, the people. We have King Ahab, and we have Jezebel, his wife. And this, these two people were the people that um, Elijah had fought against. So wonderful to see people coming in. It's wonderful. Yes. And they had fought against them. But I want to share with you the fact that this was a situational loneliness for, for Elijah. And I want to explain that by 
explaining what the types of loneliness are. So let me just hold me on what the types of loneliness are, then we get straight into the text. Oh, let's just praise God. Just let's give God praise. Just praise God for a moment. Let's just give Him the praise. Give Him the praise. Give Him the praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Oh, it's just a victory. Just a victory right now that just brought in. <laughs> oh, just giving God thanks to Tabitha for today. Let's just thank God for her. Thank God for her as she walks in. Thank you, Father. All right, so let's get into what the types of loneliness are when we get into the text. So loneliness can be emotional loneliness. Issues around how you see yourself. I don't have to move that too much. Social loneliness. Problems in social situations where you lack self-esteem. You lack feeling good about yourself and you exclude yourself. That's another type of loneliness. This third type of loneliness is, is the worst you could ever get. It's the chronic loneliness where your, your nature is so used to being lonely. It's, it's like a default button. You go into loneliness and you stay there. And I'm quite comfortable there because I'm lonely there. It's chronic. It takes a lot of work to get out of that loneliness. But the one I want to hone in on today is maybe the first part of loneliness, and that is situational loneliness. And that is where the situation and your surroundings change in a way that causes you to be lonely. Oh my goodness. And the text that we're going to read is of Elijah, where he was threatened for his life. That's going to cause you to have a situational change, right? <laughs> Jezebel, the queen, and Ahab, the king, was mad because he, Elijah had won. And Jezebel said to Elijah, this time tomorrow, I'm going to find you. And just for the sake of the children in the room, I'm going to, you're going to die. <laughs> Basically, when someone tells you that, you're not exactly going to hang around, are you? And he didn't want to hang around. And there's a lot of people that are, are faced with this situational loneliness where you're threatened in a way that places you into loneliness. And that happened in Regen, if I'm honest. The church became lonely for a while. We were outcasts because we decided to um, be a people of same, to, to, uh, to include same gender loving folk. We were outcasts and said, don't come back here anymore. Lonely. It's a lonely place when you're fighting for God. And Elijah was no different. So we take it up from there where he was accused and told, don't you come by here tomorrow. And the text starts, Elijah was afraid, Ooh, straight away, and ran for his life when he, became, when he came to Bathsheba in Judah. He left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, prayed, and you know what his prayer was? That I might die. I've had enough, Lord. I've had enough. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush, and he fell asleep. Woo! That moment of I've had enough. And nobody needs to raise their hands but there's times when we've all said that. I've had enough. Come on. Take me. This is a man of God. A man that God loved. And yet he was in that lonely place. The first challenge in the text is fear and the voice of Jezebel that tells you you need to be afraid of, of that voice and therefore you are not good enough you cannot cope you cannot do anything and the challenge is that loneliness is mixed with fear and you start believing that voice oh my goodness we know the laws in Uganda have changed we know that people are basically in situational loneliness they're running for their lives because there's, the laws have changed 
There's many situations where things are happening around the world where people are lonely. And Elijah prayed to end his life and there was no reason and nobody there to help him. Oh, can you imagine? You're a person, a man of God, and, and there's nobody, nobody there to help you. No fan saying, go Elijah, go Elijah. Beyond the service, beyond the church, beyond the people that love you, beyond the people that say, oh, oh, oh I love the way you do this. I love the way, none of that. Elijah was alone and afraid and isolated. And the text says, all at once an angel touched him. They touched him. Say so touched him. And said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head ooh, was some bread baked over hot coals and jar of water. I'm laughing because I just can't imagine this food. <laughs> he ate and drank and then he lay back down again. So there he was in his lonely state and the angel comes and touches him. Touch is important when you're lonely. Yes. Someone coming alongside you and saying, hey, how you doing? Hey. And I believe this text is talking about Regular nourishment and regular encouragement. Yes. Everybody who is lonely needs regular nourishment and regular encouragement. Woo, how's your hospitality doing? I'm so glad we break up now. Sometimes we go off and we do stuff together. We play a little game over there. We eat food together. It's good. It's connection. And everyone's still invited. Connection and encouragement is important beyond the service. Elijah went beyond what he did. Beyond. And there's people that need to come alongside you in your mental state, in your mental health. I think it's a good thing. I remember when I was 13, I always go back to 13. I don't know why, because I'm pretty going on now. Right, I won't say what age, but you know I'm going on a bit now. <laughs> but I remember when I was 13 and I was alone. Because my parents didn't give their life. None, nobody in my family gave their life. But I was sure I wanted to be with God. And I remember good old Mother Frances. <laughs> and good old Mother Brown. They'd come alongside me. And Mother Frances would take me on. And she, she'd take me on and she'd take me home after service. And then she'd, we'd have a little bit of fasting. And we'd break a bit of cracker. <laughs> That's what we used to do. And we'd have a little butter and we'd pray together. We laugh together, we joke together. And I thought, do you know what? This, this, this thing's right, you know? I'm feeling lonely, but I could come back again. You know? <laughs> because it was the nourishment and the feeding and the encouragement that helped me. If I'm honest, who have you got encouraging you in your lonely times? Who? We all say we all need an encourager. We all need an encourager beyond what it is that we do. Beyond our titles, beyond our moments, I want to ask you, who is your angel today? The angel came and touched me. Who is your angel? Oh, I believe God is talking to you today and saying, you need to find that encourager. You need to be encouraged because there's always an encourager by your side and God is the greatest encourager of all. Yes. In the text, what happened next? So he got up and he ate and he drank. Strengthened, it says, by the food he had traveled 40 days and 40 nights, nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Woo! That's funny. So he goes to the tree. I've had enough, Lord. And he goes over. 40 days, he leaves the servant, he goes over, and he's in a cave again. I don't know whether he was moving into chronic loneliness. Like, you know what, this is how I'm going to be. I'm fearful, I'm hurt, I want to stay in this little moment, leave me alone. And we all have cave moments, don't we? All of us, where your wife don't know, where your husband don't know, where your, your daughter don't know, where your son don't know. But there are cave moments. 
Because only you know you're going through it. The pain, the hurt, the struggle. And I find this text interesting that it deliberately mentions 40 days and 40 nights. And the 40 days and 40 nights is, is, is significant in, in the text is old. We had the 40 days of the flood. We had 40 days when Jesus went on the mountain. We had 40 days when um, read the, read the Moses situation. And we had 40 days when Jesus had resurrected and was about to ascend. 40 days were significant. And it represents new life and new growth. And here we have it. Elijah is in, in the cave. And he's in the cave, but something's about to happen to Elijah. When new life and new growth is about to happen. But in his moment, in his mind, I'm undone. I'm still hurting. He has a different perspective. And when we're in the cave, if you stay in the cave for too long, you have a different perspective of life. Your mental health is distorted a little bit. You think nobody cares. You think nobody loves you. You think nobody um, adores you. When actually that's a different perspective because God sees you differently. But in this moment, there's a change happening. And I believe that Elijah had to learn something while he was in the cave. He had to learn something. He had to reflect on his life. He had to think about it. Oh, and here we go. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing, Elijah? This question was asked several times. What are you doing, Elijah? I don't believe it was a shouting voice. What are you doing? You're in the cave. What's going on? And this is where we're coming alongside. We are, we are there to help each other. Are you okay? What are you doing? But God really started to talk to him in the cave. And in the reflection moments of your life, where you might be right now, in the lonely period, you might feel like, Ooh, and God says, what are you doing? And this is, this is Elijah's reply. <laughs> and it's a bit of a self-pity reply. <laughs> I have been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. I've been around for a long time, in other words. I've been fighting this fight of faith. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. You told me to go and tell them, and they didn't listen, in other words. Yeah, I'm in the cave. Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars. And put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. Hey. Let me say that again. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. In other words. He felt like he was the only one left. He's the only one doing what I'm doing. Do you ever feel that way? When you're the only one doing what you're doing. You're the only mother struggling with your children. You're the only wife struggling with your husband. You're the only husband struggling with your wife. You're the only young person struggling with your mental health. You're the only young woman struggling with, with emotions and, and internal feelings and hurt and hate and pain. I want you to know you're not the only one. In that cave, Elijah had a different perspective. And I find it interesting that God starts talking to him. And I believe first thing we need to do when we're going through loneliness is to talk. Say talk. talk. Who are you talking to? Yeah, you've got an encouragement, but who are you talking to? Who are you talking with? Who are you expressing how you're feeling with? And Elijah started to talk. But God, this is what's going on with me. Do you know I've been loving you for all this time? And we like this. You've been loving me all this time. I've been loving you all this time. But you told me to go and do that and I, I, I can't do it anymore. Leave me alone. I want to go in the cave. No. God turns around again and says, what are you doing in Elijah? And I believe that question was repeated for you to come to yourself to reflect on where you are. God speaks to Elijah in a powerful way later on in the text as you read. 
He said, you know what? Go by the cave. Go, go at this, the middle of the cave. And what I want you to do is just stand there. And in the text, an earthquake came. God wasn't in the earthquake. The wind came. You know that like the sea? God wasn't in the wind. Now, Elijah is used to fire coming and God being in the fire. But the fire came this time. And God was in the fire. You know where God was? God speaks to Elijah in a whisper, in a voice that says, Hey, I know what you're going through. God was in the whisper. And you might be struggling with stuff for yourself that nobody he knows and it's in that whisper moment I want you to take that whisper moment because God is speaking to you saying I've got you I'm leaning into you even though you're leaning away from me in the cave I'm leaning into you and I believe there's blessings in knowing that God loves you God cherishes you God cares for you God wants you back and you know what I find interesting? The same Elijah that was fearful. You know what God says to him? I want you to go back. Go back the way you came. Go back through the wilderness where you came from. I mean, what a thing to do. What? I'm running in the one direction. You're telling me to go back? He's saying, hey, there's a different perspective. There's a different change. And the reason why God told him to go back, he said, you know what? You might think you're alone. I've got 7,000 people that have not bowed down to bear back there. They need you. I've got people that need you in their life. I've got people that want you in their life. You're not alone. You're going through it, but you're not alone. It's just a period of time in your life. Whether you be a chronic, whether you be social loneliness, whether you be Situational loneliness is a time of your life that you might need to sit there for a while for you to reflect on your life. And I believe God is saying in this moment, loneliness is not a bad thing all the time. Sometimes you need to reflect. Sometimes you need to assess. Lord, just let the blessings flow in your life. Let God move in your life. Yes, I'm going to go through loneliness sometimes. Yes, yes, I'm going to go through it. Yes, I'm going to feel isolated sometimes. But you mustn't stay there. So they mustn't stay there. Oh, you mustn't stay there. You must fight to get out. And when God said to Elijah, get out, come on, come on, come on, go back where you came. There's a reason for it. You've got to keep fighting. And I want to encourage your leaders here at Regen. I want to encourage you to keep fighting, to keep going, to keep pushing through. Yes, there's times when you think, what's going on? But God is right there saying, you, we have got you. We have got you. And I want to encourage you today to push, push, push through in the text. And the final thing I want to leave with you is, is a quote from... Uh, where the edge gathers, which probably everyone knows now that I'm reading because I'm always sending out quotes on Facebook. But it's a powerful quote because it says this, if you're one of those people that want to stay alone, be careful. And it says this, all of us ought to be free, but none of us ought to even seek to be independent. The spirit of independence is the spirit of pride. And I believe that's true. Don't stay in your lonely state, but recognize that you need others around you. Recognize that God has blessings in having people around you. And be encouraged today. Yes, there are myths that you can get rid of. Yes, there are challenges in the loneliness, but there's blessings too. There's reflection. There's having a different perspective of life. There's telling you that maybe you need to learn something about yourself. There's something that you need to move on to that God is working on you to do. So be encouraged today. Be encouraged. And God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Maureen. Um, we are going to um, close this part of the session. We're going to go into uh, debrief, so we'd like to thank everyone who joined us online. We Just to let you know our service activity over the next couple of weeks, so we'll be in person next week and the week after, and then we'll be off again for three weeks. Two of those weeks will be online, one of those weeks we'll be doing um, something else, not sure which yet, uh, what yet, um, and that takes us right the way up to um, the beginning of, of, of around mid-July. So we're here in person next week and the week after, and then we're off for three weeks, um, and we'll be gathering in a different form, and then we'll be back together. I think, I think it's around the, the third week of July. So God bless you, and we'll speak to you soon.